hi, welcome to the mystical city of God, where we showcase for you Venerable Mary of Agreda's epic history of the Blessed Virgin Mary, a four-volume work, some 2,700 pages, she titled The Mystical City of God, which was also her name for the Blessed Virgin Mary, drawn from chapter 21 of the Apocalypse. Now, last week we focused on a graphic battle between Mary and all the demons of hell, and how Christ assisted his mother in vanquishing the evil spirits at the foot of the cross. If you were a premium member, then you also heard how the devils, after their defeat, held a council in hell and what tactics they had employed to bring souls to their eternal abode. This week, we extend this battle to the present day by focusing on two crowns. First, we will cover the noble crown worn by the Queen of Heaven. And if you're a premium member, you will learn about that second crown, an insidious one, which, with which Lucifer himself is crowned. But before we get started, we want to remind your, uh, your church premium, uh, church militant premium members that we're extending all these episodes just for you, doubling them actually as a way of thanking you for your financial support that enables us to make videos like this possible. So thank you very much. And if you happen to be watching the shorter version for free on YouTube, please hit that like and subscribe button and think about supporting us by becoming a premium member for just $10 a month. Uh, Rodney, this is probably one of my favorite topics, spots in the mystical city of God, talking about the two crowns. And it so dials in the totality of the economy of salvation, all the dynamic going on between good, the grace is coming from the Blessed Virgin Mary, mm -hmm. and all of the bad, the devil, the temptations coming from all the hosts of hell. Uh, I just, it's it's a marvelous. I yeah, it's 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 heartening because we're constantly, you know, we, we live on earth here where we see evil all the time. And so to, we're kind of used to seeing evil uh, having its day all the time both you know with with ourselves and in society and the church and everything so it is definitely heartening to see uh, God winning the day I think uh, yeah I think as Bishop Sheen would say uh, the devil has his hour yeah. and uh, God has his day yeah, yeah so what we're talking about here let's go to Apocalypse chapter uh, all through the mystical city of God it's exegesis it's taking scripture and talking about it so if you love the Bible you will really love the mystical city of God and how it explains stuff that, you know, you, Rodney, were looking at some of this stuff prior just to see what you could get with the fathers of the church, doctors of the church, anybody out there. And it's pretty skimpy out there with regard to the topics that we're going to be covering. Yeah, the, the fathers of the church and everything, they do. there's a fair amount of commentary uh, on the Gospels and everything. But as you get towards Revelation, the book of Revelation or Apocalypse is a very mysterious book. Um, you know, it was, it has information for us, you know, from the past for our present it was for the present of the the Christians you know a couple hundred years after our Lord it has information for us now it has information for our future and it's uh, it has a very big sense of mystery to it yeah. we're going to delve into one of those mysteries here and about the crown our lady is wearing let's go to apocalypse 12 1 an epic this is just, just uh, a perfect uh, passage for Our Lady. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars, which really hearkens us to the uh, Our Lady Guadalupe. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and that type of thing, which was an apparition uh, in the 1500s. Uh, now let's get into that crown. Paragraph 99, we're still talking about uh, volume one, the coronation. And paragraph 99 out of there explains this, dials it in for us. It says, the crown of 12 stars are evidently all the virtues with which uh, that queen of heaven and earth was to be adorned. So all the virtues, okay. But the mystery of being composed of 12 stars has reference to the 12 tribes of Israel, which you'll get some commentaries talking about, uh, by which all the elect and the predestined are designated as mentioned in the seventh chapter of the Apocalypse of the Evangelist. So uh, the uh, St. John the Evangelist writing the Apocalypse, she refers to him many times as the writer of the Apocalypse, Book of Revelation. And she refers us to, to chapter 7, where it talks about the 144,000, which basically symbolizes all the elect, the predestined, uh, that will get to heaven, meaning those who are foreknown uh, by God who will enter into heaven, not that you're predestined in the sense that you don't have a free will or a free 
mm-hmm. choice, but God knows how all things are going. Right. He's the eternal. He's outside of time, basically. And that 144,000 goes into the 12, the, the 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 tribe of Dan, 12,000 tribe, each one of the tribes. Mm-hmm. So that's what's what she's talking about, she's symbolizing the totality of all these people. And here it all comes together. She's crowned with the virtues. The 12 stands for all the people. And it says, and since the gifts, graces, and virtues of all the elect were to crown their queen in a most eminent and exalted degree, a crown of 12 stars was placed around her head. So that 12 symbolizes the 12 tribes, which is all of the people of God who will be getting to heaven someday. And all of the gifts, graces, virtues that they receive, she, some, in some way, shape, or form, advocate, mediatrix, mm-hmm. co-redemptrix, uh, is participating in Mary, mother of the church, you know, you, uh, we, we have that feast in our own day. Paul the VI said, Mary, Mother of the Church. Uh, Pope Francis actually put a, a, a day on the calendar for it. And you can just see that maternal motherhood, Mary, Mother of the Church. You would think the church is the mother of all, and yet we say Mary, mother of the church, because of that. We'll get into that in, in future episodes about how she was so instrumental with the, epoch, with the apostles and the writing and the apostles and all these different things. But continually bringing us the graces we need to do all the good works and and all the inspirations that we need to do all the good works. Yeah, because God put her in this exalted and lofty position as the mediatrix of grace. So all just like the church, like I, I think you, you noted in the past that many of the titles of Our Lady can also be attributed to the church itself. So the church is the mediatrix of grace. Uh, and all graces that God wants to give to people come through the church. All people are saved through the church. And it is also like that with Our Lady. Our Lady in her life, and you'll see, readers will see this in this book, Our Lady lived to a perfect degree everything God wanted her to do, every grace God offered her, she she accepted fully, she participated fully in it. So it makes sense then that the graces of us, that you know, we, we take advantage of, those, those have her fingerprints on it, if you will. And so uh, when people do good, that goes to her crown, that builds up her glory. Part of uh, the, what I've been working on with the mystical city of God, and hopefully it brings to fruition at some time in the future, not too distant future, is kind of, I wouldn't say fact-checking mm-hmm. these things, but seeing how they actually line up with the teaching of the church. And we're going to bring up many popes today on what they're saying about this, but first, we want to bring up the theological aspect. How is Mary's fingerprints, mm-hmm. as you say, on all of the good works? How is she being crowned, participating in those good works. And we have to start with, well, what good works are and how the graces come. Every good work uh, starts with a grace from God. Okay, that's like Catholic teaching. You don't do good on your own. You do good as as receiving the infused gift of charity, faith, hope, and charity infused, and you act upon those. so every good work starts with the grace from God, and it flows through the hands of Mary as the advocate, mediatrix, dispensatrix of all graces. And this term is called preveniate, that comes before. It's almost kind of a funny, it prevents you. Well, no, preveniate is comes before your good work. Father Hardin, here's a definition. The grace that precedes the will in choosing good. Good meaning a supernatural act, something virtuous. Right. It moves the will spontaneously, inclining it to God. A prevenient grace may be a good thought, good impulse, without human effort, uh, to perform some action that leads to heaven, some supernatural mer- meritorious act. Now all that we have left to do is say, well, how is she in that chain of events that's taking place. We know that all these graces come from Christ. He's the one that brought them all into, you know, he's the redeemer. And yet, uh, I'd like to start with um, with Pope, Pius, Pope St. Pius X, 1904, encyclical Ad Deum uh, Elum. And uh, This is what Pope Pius X says. The source, then, is Jesus Christ. So anybody out there thinking that Mary is the source? No, not the church doesn't say that. Mary of Regretta doesn't say that. We're not saying that. The source, then, is Jesus Christ. But Mary, this is his words in his encyclical, but Mary, as St. Bernard justly remarks, is the channel. Mm. He goes on to say, 
because he's talking about the mystical body of Christ, Christ is the head. He says, we mean the neck. Hmm. Yes, says St. Bernardine of Siena, she is the neck of our head, Christ, by which he, Jesus, communicates to his mystical body, us, all spiritual gifts. Hmm all spiritual gifts. So when we're talking about all of these spiritual gifts, which is graces and inspirations and uh, gifts of the Holy Spirit and whatever virtues, infused virtues, all of that flowing from Christ through Our Lady is the channel in the mystical body mm. of Christ coming to us. Uh, and then we're acting upon that and we're meriting and she's participating in that. So just like all of these redound to Christ, mm -hmm. they also in her uh, movement as the channel or the neck are redounding to her. And that's what Mary of Agreda is talking about. All the virtues of all the people of God mm -hmm. in all of their good works is what her crown is made up of. We're going to see how the opposite happens with the devil. Uh, and, and it's a really interesting thing. It's not because, well, we'll, we'll get there later. If you're a premium member, you'll find that <laughs> out at, after. If not, you're going to have to read it yourself. I'll, uh, I'll give you the, uh, I'll, I'll leave you with the paragraph to read on that. But uh, anyway, this is how Mary is, is, comes about with uh, participating in all the good works as our mother. And throughout, there are several parts in the book where Our Lady will explain you know what's going on or give some deeper a deeper meaning into what's happening and she is the first one to say that she is unworthy of these things she is god is in his uh, great mercy has lifted her to this lofty position a mere creature to be second only to him to be this great conduit of grace uh, to all of us so it says that you know all of the all of the the grace that all the saints and angels put together don't compare to the grace that our lady has in her fullness and that like you say it was really it was really crushing for her in her humility because mm -hmm. she did not merit those initial advances of God. God and to to I mean she did cooperate with them mm -hmm. but right. he kept inundating her with more and more and more graces throughout yeah. and she's like well I haven't paid you back for all these graces you just put mm -hmm. more and you just put a whole bunch more and it's like someone just keeps dumping presents mm -hmm. on you like how am I ever going to repay you and they dump more presents on right. you, yeah. more gifts because she right. saw in her humility mm -hmm. how God was the source of all these right. things we get some gift or grace We're like oh thanks God I'll take that for my own and march <laughs> off with it right Ooh, yeah. you know and, and and go be a rock star with it so, uh, here's another one. Pope Pius XII, 1954 encyclical Acele, Acele uh, uh, Regnum, uh, Reginum. She receives the royal right, paragraph 39, she receives the royal right to dispose of the treasures of the divine Redeemer's kingdom. So, it's his treasures, but she dis receives the right to dispose of. Pope uh, Pius VII in 1823 called Mary the dispensatrix of all graces. Pope Pius IX, 1878, and speaking to the bishops of the world, made use of the words of St. Bernard, God wills that every grace should come to us through her, which is what Pius X also did. Um, Leo XIII, 1891 encyclical, uh, by the will of God, Mary is the intermediary through whom is distributed unto us the immense treasure of the mercies gathered by God. Um, so, I mean, this is just a, a very small sampling mm -hmm. of the popes. I could have just gone on and on and on about all, and even Vatican II talks about many of these things in, in Lumen Gentium, paragraph 61, 62, very Marian uh, encyclicals or uh, passages in Lumen Gentium. Uh, so the church is continually getting more and more and more fervent throughout the ages and more clear, uh, just like it, it talked about the Trinity in the early ages of the church. Then it talks about the incarnation. Mm -hmm. Then it talks about uh, the, the, the church herself and her sacraments throughout the ages. You know, you get more into the 1500s, more about the sacraments and things. Mm -hmm. Then you'll get more into the age of Mary and the age actually of the laity mm -hmm. today, also St. Joseph. Mm -hmm. So there's right. this, this high hierarchy of truths that's coming out that are all uh, the church has her God has his reasons mm -hmm. for revealing and bringing these truths out gradually mm -hmm. uh, and that's why Mary of is very clear that why all these things weren't contained in and the gospels. And these things were always true. It's just that the emphasis on them changes throughout the ages. Right and, and the clarity of those too. Yeah. So it, we're, we're really um, 
that crown, just to tie up again, that crown is the Blessed Virgin Mary. Her crown is all of our good works, all of our good deeds, everything that she participates in with the prevenient grace coming to us to enable us to do that redounds to that splendid crown, which is kind of neat that we're helping decorate her, but aren't we also doing that for the greater glory of God? Mm -hmm. So we are building the greater glory of God. We always talk about everything for the greater glory of God. And we're part of that greater glory is the Blessed Virgin Mary and her crown. So it really all ties together quite nicely. That's it for our shorter version for the non-premium members. We will see you next week when we talk about the greatest battle ever waged between the woman and uh, a woman of Genesis and the serpent. And this one took place not on land, but on sea. Also, if you aren't a premium member, you want to catch up to the next part of the show, it's uh, paragraph 103, a uh, little cliff note there, in the, core, uh, the con uh, conception. Volume 1, paragraph 103 is what we're going to be talking about next, about how the devil also has his crown. Until next week, God bless you.